I am very excited about this next system project and what's happening because as I think many of you are probably aware, we're standing at an extraordinary uh, historical moment for the species. It's actually something of an evolutionary uh, moment uh, at which we have to make some very, very deep choices. And um, as some of you know, I've been in this kind of area for, for a long time trying to sort out why is our current economy failing so badly and what are the alternatives. And Peter started out with two statistics that I want to reiterate because they kind of sum up uh, the big picture. And the first one, of course, was that we're consuming as a species 1.6 times what Earth can sustain. Now, we're not just ta talking about stuff we take out of the ground and the minerals and so forth. What we're really talking about is the living Earth, which best understood is a living organism that maintains the cleanliness of the water, the stability of the climate, and so forth. And that's, that's a very important large frame. And it's essential to understanding how life organizes on this particular planet organizes as a community to create and maintain the conditions essential to complex forms of life like humans. And it's so extraordinary, you put this in the big picture, that now the physicists and astronomers are saying there's, you know, there's trillions of universes out there and multiple trillions of planets and so forth. And yet, as far as we know, this is still the only one that can support the life forms that we find on this planet. Um, so in addition to the idea we'll move to Mars as being a little nutty headed, uh, it sets kind of a context for what we need to be doing now because the challenge of our time is to create an economy. And can you all hear me? Okay. Create, to create an economy that works in a balanced relationship with a living planet and do that in a way that meets the needs of everyone. So right now we know we're way into overshoot in terms of the demands as humans are putting on the planet. And then we hit this other statistic of 62 people, 62. Just about the number of people we got in this room own as much wealth as half of humanity. Now, when you get into the question of how much inequality is too much, I think we could all agree that's probably too much. <laughs> I mean, it's obscene beyond imagination, to put it bluntly. Now, it's not just a matter of being fair, but it's a matter of recognizing that if we don't bring ourselves into balance, with the living earth. And we don't learn how to do that in a way that meets the essential needs of everyone. We're finished. The whole system's going to collapse. So it goes way beyond fairness. It creates a very immediate self-interest for everyone, supposedly including even those 62 uh, people at the very, very top. So that's the challenge. Now, as some of you know, I've been, I've been working on these issues for a long time. Uh, last year just came out with the 20th anniversary edition of When Corporations Rule the World, uh, as well as the book Change the Story, Change the Future, which is my kind of current look into the future. Now, in terms of what's happening and the significance of this next system project, in 1995, when, when Corporations Rule the World came out, uh, I was very deeply involved with the International Forum on Globalization, which was actually, it turned out a very powerful, very small network, again, about the same number of people in this room, uh, that led the way in terms of uh, creating the story and mobilizing the global movement that began to really uh, create a resistance against uh, these international agreements like NAFTA, which are really corporate rights agreements. And we may say a little bit more about that. But it was, 
you know, we were beginning to wake up to the fact that in the United States, you know, we had, we had a strong middle class coming out of World War II. And then as we got into the 70s and on into the 80s, increasingly, we, inequality was growing, the, the uh, middle class was shrinking. We were getting into more and more awareness of environmental problems. And so in 1995, we were mainly focused on creating resistance against this process of concentrations of corporate power, detached from community and from the needs of real people. So um, that was one historic moment. Now many of us at that time knew that it was essential that we not just resist, but we actually had to have in mind an alternative. There had to be a positive vision, and that's why some of us were involved, and the Pinchos were also involved in this in founding Yes Magazine, to tell the stories of people who were talking about deep change. Now, at that time, the, those of us trying to look systemically at the alternative were quite few. This was a very, very scattered movement. And what I sense at this particular moment is that that is really coming into vogue. And this next system project and the teach-ins all around the country, uh, which are not just taking one group of people around the country, one group of experts, but which are bringing out uh, people have been working on these issues in many different places. And I've been looking at some of the videos and it's just extraordinary to see all of these people who are you know, underlying th thinking from a similar set of principles. Uh, to create the framework of a fundamental new system. Now, part of understanding this is recognizing that we're, we're dealing with a system in place that is not just broken. It is a failed system, in a sense. But as Peter pointed out in the very beginning of, of this session, in some ways, it's a system that works perfectly in doing what it is designed to do. Now, I find this a really interesting kind of mental exercise. You look at the system as it is and how it's designed with increasingly the economy controlled, the means of living controlled by global corporations. And you start out, you get the smaller corporations, which to me, they're best understood as legally protected pools of money seeking to grow themselves. <laughs> and you got one pool of money is then owned by another pool of money, and then that's owned by another pool of money, and another pool of money. And the people, who, the humans who are making decisions at the top in terms of the big Wall Street uh, uh, equity funds and so forth, they're just working for these pools of money, and they're evaluated solely on how fast those pools of money grow. Now you've got to say, is this, is this a sensible system uh, if you want to create a world that meets everyone's needs in a balanced relationship with a living planet? Hmm. What do you think? Now obviously there is no way that that system can get to where you want to get. But if your goal is to create a system that concentrates power without accountability and in the process turns living earth into a dead rock, you got any ideas on how to improve that system? I haven't been able to think of any, but if, you know, it's an interesting exercise. But it helps get you into the mental state of, oh, so if I wanted to do, I wanted a different outcome. I want to bring us humans into balance with the living earth, the living community of life that has been for billions of years self-organizing and this is a fascinating part about the evolutionary process of life on Earth, that it started out with just these simple single-celled organisms. And they somehow were self-organizing along with the geological processes of Earth to change the chemical composition of the atmosphere, change the comp chemical composition of the oceans, 
create the climatic patterns, ultimately creating the soils and so forth, and creating all of these characteristics from which life sprang forth and then continued to evolve uh, through self-organizing processes until we humans came forward and declared ourselves Earth's most intelligent species. And now we're setting about reversing the whole process that makes our existence possible. So I don't know if we want to spend time on are we an intelligent species. Uh, I do think we have the potential to become an intelligent species and that is part of the challenge of our time. Okay, now in terms of the economy, a long time ago, I had a Filipino economist when I was living in the Philippines. I asked him, his name was Sixto Rojas, I said, Sixto, why is it that economists so often come up with the wrong solutions? He says, oh, that's simple. He says, when you're creating an economics, the framework, the intellectual framework, You've got a choice. You can either organize around the firm or you can organize around the household. And it's very different because if it's just the firm, then it's about maximizing profit. If it's organizing around the household, it's about making a living. Well, that's interesting. Now, what we have done you know, the community is simply an aggregation of households from this perspective. And what we've done is, choosing the firm, we've now graduated into global corporations, which are, I know, are the pools of money, owned by pools of money, owned by pools of money. Uh, and we have created, changing the rules, partly through these trade agreements, so that these corporations have more rights than the communities that we depend on to organize and to create our living. Now, I'm trying to summarize a lot of stuff very quickly. It's, all, it's actually all very straightforward, and I see you nodding your heads, because most of what I'm talking about is absolutely straightforward. It is dead simple. You all absolutely know it, <laughs> except it's not what you normally hear. Now, if we're going to have a rational economy, we need to organize like the way life organizes. Life organizes around bioregions, bioregional systems. Those bioregional systems are essentially self-reliant. They organize around the locally available resources, the locally available water, minerals, sunlight, energy, et cetera, et cetera to continuously maintain the conditions needed by all the members of the community, all the different organisms that are part of it. And we're sort of taught about a biology of competition and survival of the fittest and so forth. What we rarely are taught about is how, well, at a deeper level, is this process of, of cooperation. And we, don't, we have the, only the vaguest ideas of how it works but it does work, ultimately, to create this extraordinary system. Just to get the idea in terms of how life organizes, you think about your own body. Now, each of us, our body is comprised of tens of trillions of individual decision-making cells. Now, somehow, all of those are working together, making decisions and so forth, all in those individual cells. The nervous system has something to do with it, but very little. Most of the cells are somehow communicating with each other. They're maintaining constant exchanges of energy, water, nutrients, information, to maintain the physical structure in which my consciousness is lodged. Wow, that's kind of bright, breathtaking when you think about it. I got no idea how it works. Well, I got some idea, but... It is still so far beyond our understanding. Now, what we have to do is create an economy which organizes the way life organizes. So that we're each of us involved in participating in the work, the work that is necessary to maintain the system in balance with Earth. And the, the only way that one can imagine 
doing this in a way that works for the whole planet is each community within its basic boundaries, and this is not closed boundaries because life is constantly interacting, but it still has the integrity, organizing within those boundaries to meet its own needs. And it's fascinating to me because back when I studied market economics before it was taught as ideology, discussions of the market economy sounded awfully much like the way life organized. If you go back and read Adam Smith, he was talking about one-person firms. And he was, I mean, the kind of firms you were talking about in the cooperatives, they're a little big for Adam Smith, but the basic idea that these are place-based enterprises owned by the people who work in them and who depend on them, who have an interest in their long-time future, and who live in the community where they all share the benefits of everyone doing well <laughs> and being concerned with each other, taking care of each other, maintaining the infrastructure they need together, the educational systems, the health systems, and so forth. Now, the interesting thing, once you get into higher level, once you go back and really examine David Ricardo and the basic foundations of trade theory, you also find that is also consistent with a picture of you know, fundamental principles of trade theory. <laughs> Say that ownership needs to be national. The trade needs to be balanced between countries. That wealth, you know, economic power, I mean, the, the, the market allocates efficiently, does a terrific job of allocating efficiently if there's an equitable distribution of economic power. The thing that baffles me with economists is all of these things are, are actually fundamental to market theory if you're, if you're dealing with the real theory and not the ideology. Um, and, you know, markets for certain functions are an ideal form. Okay, now, I'll just drop another idea on you and then I think we want to move to, uh, to discussion. Um, several people have mentioned capitalism. We don't often refer to socialism. Bernie's very open about that. But we get stuck in these labels. We get stuck and it's, you know, I've given my talks on corporate rule and had somebody raise their hand and say, but you didn't talk about capitalism. What the hell did you think I was talking about? <laughs> Just how do you define capitalism? <laughs> now that's important because in fact, if you take a literal de definition of capitalism, it simply is a system in which power resides with the people who own the means of production. Now you can organize that in various ways, like you can organize it as a cooperative, you can organize it as all single person firms. Um, or you can organize it so that the ownership is all concentrated essentially in global financial markets that have absolutely no connection to any community. In a way, you could call any of those capitalism, and if you're favorable to capitalism, you usually d describe your version of it in one that sounds like a bunch of local businesses. If you're against it, you'll describe it as a bunch of, a bunch of global financial markets and corporations, but either way, we have no idea what we're talking about unless we actually get down to describe the system. Now, it's interesting, I've been thinking about it. Both capitalism and socialism have their authoritarian forms, obviously on the socialist side where it's all a, a centralized authoritarian government or on the, uh, uh, the capitalist side where it's essentially authoritarian corporations and detached and unaccountable financial markets. But people who use the term socialism have the same thing. Are they talking about a centralized Soviet state with authoritarian control of everything? Or are they talking about the kinds of systems you had in Yugoslavia with you know, worker cooperatives and so forth and localized economies and possibly even including a lot of individual owned stores? Now it's interesting, if you kind of think about the democratic convergence 
and recognize that what we're really talking about, what we want, is deep economic democracy and a mixed system, you know, each thing done in the sort of the form that is most appropriate to that particular task. Is it capitalist or socialist? Well, the terms become meaningless, which is why I don't like to use them. Um, but what we're, you know, what we're talking about is a system of organized around the principles of life that are local, that involve with the firm uh, working with the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, uh, which I was part of, of founding and developing. Uh, Judy Wicks, who was one of the founders, talked about the living return, which I think is a, a beautiful frame for thinking about the businesses that we need to create. A living return sort of sounds like a triple bottom line, but it's, it's, it's not. It's, it's a much deeper concept. It's not just that you should have you know, good environmental and social outcomes, but it is if you are an entrepreneur investor in your community, and that would include the owners of the, of the co-op, your return on your investment, which is both a financial investment and an investment of your soul and your, your life energy and so forth, then you are not only getting uh, you know, a modest financial return to meet your needs for money, for the things we have to buy, but you're also uh, getting a return in terms of the benefits of living in a healthy community with a healthy natural environment. So that is a living return. So to me, the goal we're looking for is a global system of local, bioregionally defined economies that share participation in the ownership of real assets. And here the question of the difference between uh, you know, just pure financial assets, which is nothing but money, money it's just a, it's a, an, another, a number, and real wealth, which are is the essentials of, of living. Um, so, this, be, you know, that uh, I, I think we've got to, we've got to, I want to move into to a discussion session if we still got time for that. And uh, we'll see where you want to take this. Obviously, this is a huge topic and we could take it in many, many different directions, uh, going for hours. But what, I'd like to see what you're picking up on and either th ideas you want to contribute or things that you want, would like me to clarify. Are you going to be the moderator or? Sure, well, if anyone who wants to ask David a question, raise your hand, and all I ask is to speak loudly. It's going to be difficult given the configuration, so just please speak up. But uh, maybe uh, raise your hand and we'll go if you have a question. Yeah. Uh, for economic structures going beyond the firm or co-ops and a, a different source, uh, is it necessary to have a currency and a banking system Mm. Or, I mean, what are, you, what are your ideas for improving the operation between all the firms? Interesting, yeah. Okay, right. I, yeah, I had plan to say more about money, but it's always a matter of time. <laughs> oh, that was fine. <laughs> Thank you. We get so caught up in our failure to understand the nature of money. Now, even the term that, you know, we were using the term capital earlier, and there's a question, well, what do you refer to as capital, and, or what do you find as, as assets, and it's the, the financial value or the, the total of financial assets. The term capital is one of the major reasons that we seem to be unable to have an intelligent conversation about the economy. Because the term capital, it's actually the same, you know, in business school, I, I know in business school, you use the term resources, assets, uh, capital. Um, I think those, those are the ones that come to mind immediately. None of those tell you whether the person is using the term is talking about a real resource like land or a building or technology or human skills or any of the things that are absolutely essential to life and to a productive process. Or whether they are simply talking about money, which properly understood is nothing but an accounting chit. 
And you think about it. There is nothing outside the human mind that can recognize it. It's totally intangible. And the fascinating thing is we organize our economy around the idea that money is the ultimate constraint. Wow, isn't that odd? Because as we all see, if you're paying attention, the Federal Reserve can create it with a keystroke, trillions of dollars. Well, the market's inflated or it goes away and trillions of dollars just simply disappear overnight. Real capital doesn't disappear instantly. The fascinating thing about an economy, you have, you have a financial crash and the economy comes to a stop. Now you've got all the same people, the same skills, you've got the same building, you've got the same technology, you've got the same needs. You have everything except somehow these numbers flowing around on computers stop flowing and the whole thing stops. Now, that is part of a process <laughs> of reducing the whole of society into a condition of slavery. You know, there's different, there's different levels of slavery. Some is less, is more tolerable than others, but it is essentially, uh, you know, different forms of involuntary servitude. And the kind of situation we're in currently where people are desperate for any kind of job to get any kind of money that they can get because it's essential to get their food and water to live and a place to, a place to put over their head. All to get money to be able to have access to the real assets that corporations increasingly own. I'm kind of backing into some of these subjects, so it may, it may not be as clear as I would, would like what I'm saying here, but this, this comes out of the, you know, the experience working overseas in international development. You know, we're told, told by the World Bank that, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm kind of going all around your question. <laughs> we're told by the World Bank and IMF that you know, the, the market system, capitalism, is eliminating global poverty. Now, if you go back and take that apart, the development process, the movement of capitalism or the corporate control into the economies of poor countries was a process of pushing people off the land, the means by which they, they earned their, they created their livelihood without money but many of them live quite well in terms of a healthy diet and, and healthy families and strong communities and secure shelter and all that sort of thing. But they had no money. Well, some people claim they, they really weren't poor until development pushed them off of the farm into the factories, into the itinerant um, agricultural workforce and left them dependent on money and then the World Bank comes and says, look at this, see, we're ending poverty. We've got people now earning more than a dollar and a half a day, so they're better off. You begin to get into this framework and you see what's, what's happening in terms of the whole, uh, the whole global system. So par you know, part of this regaining control uh, is part of partly also reducing our dependence on the market economy. You know, youth going back to the land, growing their own food. Young couples going back and taking care of their own children, cooking our own meals, uh, things that we do as a family to reduce our dependence on money. Anyhow, that's, there, there's, so many, there's so many dimensions to this, and we, we could go on and talk about the whole banking system and so forth, but I think we need to yeah. touch some other um, topics. So in terms of all over the world. There's, there's, yeah. there's things sprouting up everywhere and the, the, the social media is possibly happening faster. Yeah. But I'm afraid it's not going to happen fast enough I am to too. save <laughs> us and the planet. And so my question is, do you, what leverage points do you see that are higher up in the system that we can kind of target to try and 
make it all happen faster. The critical thing, the critical starting point to me is the story. You know, learning how to express these new frames to help people see the difference, the fundamental difference in choice between an economy that's organized by global corporations and an economy that's organized around local communities that control their own resources and their own rules. The interesting thing is, if a corporation comes in and gets control of your water or your land or, you know, to do fracking or whatever, you've got no right to exclude them. But if you want to go in and get hold of the corporation's assets, they have every right to exclude you. Now, you know, there's all these dimensions of it, but this is where, you know, we need to be getting our stories clear so that we're taking the discussion to a deeper level and creating this awareness of really, you know, what is the difference between the, ex the system we have and the system we're creating. Now, it's, it's obviously very helpful in, in describing the system we're creating, the fact that we do have all of these examples and we have all of these initiatives around the world, but in the, each in themselves are very micro. Um, so it's very important to tell the story in ways that connect them. What the, what the author of that has very cleverly avoided uh, is any system that is really democratic and locally rooted. Uh, the, uh, oh. My, <clears throat> oh, yeah, the framework of subsidiarity. One of the things that we came to in, the, in, the, uh, in our work with the International Forum on Globalization was the, the it's actually an established organizational concept of subsidiarity that the, the proper role of higher levels of governance is to create the conditions that protect the right of communities to manage to control and manage their own resources and that is basically the system that we need to create now I mean that this is a framework for understanding what these trade agreements are really about because what they're about is writing the rules so that communities cannot control their local economies in any way. Uh, not even national governments can control them. They're all controlled by the top level. Now, it's interesting when we were having our discussions um, between the, nor the, per the participants from northern or high income countries and our members from low income countries, all of us from the north tended to come around to, well, we need some global rules that you know, tell people how they can use the resources and so forth. And the people from poor countries said, well, you know, you guys from the north, from the colonial countries, you always seem to like these centralized uh, systems. Those of us from the south, we know the experience when you guys are making the rules at that level, it somehow doesn't work out for us. And those of us from the north ultimately realize they're absolutely right. And what we need is a system that is much more decentralized. And I, I, th I think what you were outlining did not, did not give us that option. <laughs> uh, I think right now is a good chance, a good opportunity for the break. There's snacks and beer and wine available and people may need yeah. the facilities. Um, we'll come back in 15 minutes and continue this discussion. Great. Thank you.